George Kirkpatrick, Inspiration for the Nation. We are so pleased to be joined by this distinguished brother, the former president of the University of the District of Columbia, former president of Mega Evers College, former dean of the School of Social Work at Syracuse University. It's William L. Pollard, Dr. William L. Pollard. Doc, so good to see you, man. How you doing? Better to see you, George. How you doing? I'm, I'm doing good. So what I was thinking about what's going on in this country right now with the racial pandemic, the COVID, uh, the chaos around the elections. And I said, I need some perspective. And so I said, I know Bill Pollard has got something to say. And so here we are. So, so where you want to start doc? <laughs> I'll start with, I, I got a, I got a text message from a friend of mine this morning. Mm -hmm. uh, wondering, he said he was really, he was really uh, just perturbed by what was going on. And I said, black folk have been perturbed like this since 1877 at the close of Reconstruction. That's right. And what, what we've been witnessing, George, in my opinion, over the last 18 months is a resurgence of, of the efforts taken to deprive black folk of the vote following Reconstruction. Except we aren't seeing lynching now, but we're seeing all kinds of other legal uh, machinations to try to keep people from voting. And, and I just saw on TV that Trump has just launched two more uh, lawsuits uh, against somebody. The, oh, no, the judge tossed them out in Michigan and uh, Arizona, I believe. Oh, he tossed them out. So that's good. Yeah, and we should say by the at the time of this conversation, the quote election results are not yet decided. And that's by the correct. time people hear this or see this, it may be decided. But still in all, the fact that you've got a, a, a president, but I think you were astute to point out that this is not new in history, that this is a pattern uh, that has been happening for all along. And and I, I, I'm glad that you pointed out to your friend, this is what we've been dealing with because this is a new awakening for some people, and, and but not for us. That's correct. That's correct. Yeah, and, and so when I think about uh, this moment, what do we make of this, Bill? What do, you, what, what do we make of this? It's, it's, it's more of the same, George. Uh, you would think you would think that this stuff was over with the election of Obama, but but in, in some sense, the election of Obama represented a a a mark in history, and now we're trying to turn back the clock as though that never happened. Mm -hmm. And and I think that the the more poignant observation is what is taking place in Europe now. We've mm -hmm. seen the rise of right-wing efforts, activity in Europe. And we also, we're seeing people looking at us now from France, from England, from Germany, wondering what the heck is going on in the, in the United States of America. Uh, and I, for the life of me, I don't know why people don't read their history. And I guess in large measure, we don't require history anymore. Uh, and so we just need to take a look now and re-examine what took place following 1877. In fact, uh, my wife and I were in Wilmington, North Carolina recently. Uh, this was before COVID. And uh, we saw some things there where people were talking about the Wilmington riots of 1899. Mm -hmm. When when the North Carolina legislature put in place procedures to prevent black folk from voting, their grandparents didn't vote before the Civil War. Do you hear what I said? What? And so consequently, wow. no, they put in place, uh, this was when they kicked out all of the representatives who were black out of the Congress. They were intimidated, they were threatened with lynching, et cetera, et cetera. They were run out of town, literally. And the Wilmington riots was an example of what took place on the far extreme right of the scale in terms of in intimidation. And so now we have in this country, we, we have the movements, right? So with Black Lives Matter. And one of the things that I've been talking about or been thinking about is well, you talk about that history, right? So how do we get translate the history to the Twitter, TikTok, Instagram, quick, quick, in and out generation. And I'm not saying that young people aren't studying and they're not doing history, but I am saying that what people have become more accustomed to is digestible nuggets, yeah. right? And yeah. so how, so, so there's two things. So there's one, 
how do we get people to be more let me i started with black lives matter and i'm basically saying how do we integrate the movement of history and and people like yourself who have been on the front lines and uh but of a different generation having experienced jim crow and all of that in your in your in your childhood to a generation now that is on doing it a different way and and and, and how how do we how do we how do we have that connection george i'm having a discussion now with a colleague at the university of pittsburgh about this very matter and, and one of the things that uh he has pushed me to try to explain in terms of of looking at myself and what has happened to me over the past 60 years or so is the fact that we no longer have things in the African-American community that were sustaining, that were that provided some leverage in order to ensure that we understood what was going on around us. I, I, I'll give you two quick examples. When I was in elementary school, we had a, a Caucasian teacher who came in to teach us how to play the tonette or the, the recorder. Mm -hmm. And whenever this man would come into our classroom, he would raise the window. Whether it was zero degrees outside or 105 degrees out of, outside. And so we would ask our black teacher in our segregated school, what's up with that? She explained to us that white people think we stink. Mm. Are you listening to me, George? I hear you. So what she was doing was she was educating about us about how we were regarded in the other community. What we don't have now are teachers in our school system who have that knowledge, who have that understanding, who can transfer the knowledge to our young people to help them to understand what racism is all about because this is at the very base level of, of racism the other thing that we have now is we don't have the kind of leadership direct leadership in our community to work with our young people through our churches and our civil rights organizations as we did back in the day and so there's a there are lessons to be learned that are no longer being taught. One more thing, our teachers in those segregated schools always insisted that we not take the world for granted. And they would constantly remind us that because you're black, you have to be better. Mm -hmm. are, you, are you hearing what I'm saying, George? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because you're black, you're gonna be better. So if you go into this civil service exam and you need a C plus to pass the exam, our teachers will say to us, you all can't get a C plus. You all have got to get B plus or A because you're black. And the assumption is we aren't going to get advanced for that reason. So I think that when you mentioned Instagram and all of that other stuff, we had that then. We don't have it now. Mm. Uh, William Pollard joining me now here in Inspiration for the Nation, good friend of the community. And we're glad you're back in Syracuse, by the way. Uh, because we need your wisdom. I, I, as you were talking, I'm thinking that there is a conversation happening in this country and in this community right now that I need your help with specifically, right? From your from your um, scholarship, and this is this: we're having a conversation right now about the idea of white supremacy and systemic racism embedded within our institutions. But when we name it as such and say that that's what we're trying to do to dismantle the foundations of white supremacy in the foundations of institutions that we inherit, people are getting offended by that. So I'm asking you, Doc, how, how does someone do the work without naming what it is they're trying to dismantle? You without people being, a, you can't do it, right? You can't do it. You can't, you can't. See, the problem is, in my opinion, the problem is we don't know our history. There's a lot of controversy surrounding, uh, and, and the mayor is going to catch all kinds of flack for his decision with respect to, to Columbus Circle. But when you come to know and understand our history and come to know and understand what happened in Rome back in the 14th and 15th century with the 
advent of discovery. That is that white people, Europeans had a responsibility to go out and discover and take over the world. And whoever was there that did not look like them had to be put in a particular place or killed. You understand what I'm saying? So this is what happened in the Americas. We're talking about what happened in the Caribbean area and Puerto Rico and throughout. Columbus slaughtered the Caribbean, the Indians. And then when the Europeans came to what is now the United States of America, we did the same thing. If you read some of the history of the United States of America, the, God, the, the father of our country distributed smallpox blankets to the native people to help wipe them out. Historically, that has been identified as part of the problem in this country. If we go back to Wounded Knee, the Sand Creek Massacre, all of that happened, George, with under the name of racism and white supremacy. Now, we don't teach history, we don't seem to teach history anymore. Um, and, and more recently, I've seen in the last 10 or 15 years where they're rewriting Texas history and they talk about immigrants who were hired in Texas to work those cotton fields. Now, you and I know they were not immigrants. No. They were Negro slaves. Right. You, you see the play and, on words here? And the state with, which was the last to officially abolish it. Yes, 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 yes. So, so people get defensive today about something they don't know or don't understand or don't want to know and don't want want to understand. I mean, this week, I, more than once, I've heard your president, 45, talk about I'm the least racist person in the room. Now, you and I are not quite the same age. I'm a bit older. <laughs> but as soon as, you know, we hear that growing up and right. we know, uh-oh. 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 Uh -oh. Exactly. There's, there's something wrong here. Yeah. No. So, we don't know our history. We don't know. All right, so then what... I don't want to say what do we do now, but what do we do now? Because we it it, it 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 feels it feels like something about to jump off, depending upon these election results, and you know the youth in the community, the youth are on the streets now. They're not trying to hear it because we're not even finished dealing with Breonna Taylor, George Floyd, and and then and the list continues to grow. Philadelphia, not too long ago, right down the road here in Rochester, so. How do we consciously do this work and create the communities that we want? Uh, I, I, I don't know. What do we do, Doc? I, th I think part of what we do, George, is that you and I have to continue to have these kinds of discussions, and we have to have them in a planful way with the intention of educating and bringing people up to date. Okay. Uh, one, one of the things that, that I've been talking with my friend in Pittsburgh about is, is my work with the late John Hope Franklin. I think you know, based upon the work we did in DC when I was at UDC, that, that John Hope Franklin wrote a book in 1953, I think it was in 53, From Slavery to Freedom. Mm. I would wonder how many of the teachers teaching any kind of American history in our public schools today know the significance of John Hope Franklin's book, From Slavery to Freedom in which he detailed our beginnings of this country, not with this country, but with Africa, and mm. bringing us up through 65 and into the 20th century with people dragging and kicking to keep Black folk in a different place, not in the same place as white people. And somehow we have got to get a hold of our educational systems to ensure that they get knowledge, real knowledge about the founding of this country and where this country was 400 years ago and how it came to be. Without that knowledge, you're gonna get the resistance that you referred to before when people say, I'm not a racist, I don't understand, I'm not a racist, I don't know what white supremacy is. There's no such thing as white supremacy, et cetera, et cetera. And with that, so here's what the commitment is. We will have some further conversations because the work must be done. 
And we need people like you to teach us, uh, to en enlighten us about the the knowledge that we need and the knowledge that we Oh, line, George, George, let's you and I plan to have a sit-down conversation and let's see if we can't map this out. I can't do all of it. There are some things that I, I do know about. I do know a lot about the post-reconstruction period and the period that gave rise to where we are now. And there are some others who have a better understanding of the, some of the events after and some of the events before. That's a commitment. We will make it happen. Dr. William Pollitt, former president at Medgar Evers University of District of Columbia, but in Syracuse, we know him best from his work at the Syracuse University School as the dean of the School of Social Work. It's got a different name now, but when you were there, it was a school of social work. I take um, pleasure in saying I was the founding <laughs> dean of what is now the Falk College. All right, now founding dean, there you go. What is now the Falk College. Let's 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 tell the history, right? Let's tell the history. Well, uh, Dr. William L. Pollard, thank you so much, Bill. We appreciate you and we will talk soon, all right? All right my pleasure, George. Inspiration for the nation.